Hello, and welcome back to AP Environmental Science. Today I want to talk about the fluid fossil fuels, and that would be oil and natural gas. And to start our conversation, let's talk about oil. So oil is the liquid fossil fuel that we use. And uh, when we talk about oil, we're talking about petroleum. And like coal and natural gas, it is a hydrocarbon. Well, it's, it consists of lots of hydrocarbons, actually. Uh, and a lot of these are not just chain hydrocarbons. They're also the aromatic hydrocarbons, which are rings. And these will come up later on when we start talking about pollutants and pesticides and things like that. Now, like coal, it's also going to have sulfur and nitrogen. And so when we burn oil, uh, we are going to get carbon dioxide, our SOxes, and our NOxes, just like we do with coal. You'll see, though, that mercury is not going to be an issue the same way it is with coal. Uh, and we'll talk about what's in natural gas in just a minute. But, but petroleum is a whole variety of organic molecules, okay? And what that means is that when you think about oil, a lot of times you'll think about gasoline, but, but gasoline is only one type of petroleum. It is only one petroleum product, and it's not even the only fuel. There's also diesel fuel, there's aviation fuel, there's all kinds of things, um, and the, the products themselves will range from very small chains or rings, your really light liquids, uh, all the way to really thick pasty liquids like Vaseline and even into your waxes like paraffin wax. That's actually a petroleum product as well. So your first question is, of all of, um, all of the following are derived from petroleum except which one? So we've got cellulose, DDT, asphalt, polystyrene, and nylon. So first of all, it's kind of amazing that four of these things actually are petroleum derivatives, right? Uh, so the answer to the the exception to petroleum derivatives is going to be cellulose. And cellulose is a plant product, um, and it's one of the uh, fiber fibers in plants, right? And so that's going to be the answer. But DDT, asphalt, polystyrene, and nylon are all petroleum derivatives. DDT is a pesticide we've talked about before. Asphalt is the um, black top, like that, the black paving material. Polystyrene and nylon are both plastics. You can think of polystyrene in terms of like styrofoam cups, uh, and you can think of nylon, like nylon fabrics, like windbreakers and things like that. Okay. So the first thing that we want to talk about is where does oil come from, like drilling for oil. And oil is like coal. It's in the ground. It's made in very much the same way. You have this intense heat and pressure on organic materials, usually like, you know, swampy stuff, uh, plants. And then you get little pockets of oil and gas. And oftentimes oil and natural gas hang out together. They don't always, um, but a lot of times they do, right? So we'll talk in terms of getting out oil and natural gas, the process can be a little bit different um, depending because obviously gas is a gas and oil is a liquid. Um, but but overall, it's very similar. The first thing that you're going to do is drill a well. And in recovery, recovery is pulling stuff out of the ground. Um, you've got primary recovery and secondary recovery. And this is a picture of one of the old style like wildcatting wells where they used to tap in and then they just let the oil flow off of the top. And so all of this is oil and it's all landing on the ground. It's going into groundwater. This is very polluting. So the original um, oil recovery was really not good for the environment at all, okay? We don't do this anymore. We actually cap it and, and we control the flow. And so there's, there's not this massive amount of oil that just gets wasted. Also, it's tremendously wasteful, right? Um, so we don't do that. But basically, we drill a well. And when you first tap into a new reserve, uh, that oil is going to come out on its own, right? And so the pressure that's being placed on it by the rock layers above uh, are, is going to, that pressure is going to push the oil out and so it'll flow by itself. At some point you're going to lose that pressure and you move into the secondary recovery phase and at that point you need to actually um, pump the, the wells, right? You need to pump the oil out of the wells and so you will insert either a gas or a liquid to push the oil out. It's going to push pre put pressure on the oil and push it up into the producing wells. So for, for all these producing wells that are in secondary recovery, you're also going to have a, an injection well in addition to that. 
Okay, so let's talk about refining oil. So once you get the oil, it's crude oil. Um, and there are different kinds of crude oil that have different things in them depending on what reserve you got this out of. Um, but basically you have, remember, this um, mixture of all of these different chemicals. Okay, uh, and so now we need to go through this fractionating distillation process. And so what we're going to do is to refine the oil, you have to distill it into the different weights, right? And so the lightest things are going to be uh, things like propane, right, and gasoline. And then uh, as you go down, you the distillation column you get heavier stuff because remember small molecules have really low vo uh, boiling points and so they're gonna flow off more easily really large molecules um, those you're gonna have you're gonna have those left over okay and so you can kinda see as we go through here you've got your gasolines they're really light and uh, you've moved down into your kerosene naphtha is for making chemicals and we're not really gonna talk about it but there's a huge demand for it. Um, then we move into our kerosenes and our jet fuels. Diesel is a whole lot heavier than gasoline, as you can see. And then your fuel oils, this is like what uh, ships run off of. Or if you have a uh, petroleum-powered um, electrical plant. And then you move into your uh, lubricants and waxes and right are all down here. And then uh, the last thing, the heaviest thing, is going to be the um, bitumen, which is for... Um, like asphalt production and stuff like that. Okay, so distillation is how we get the distillate, distillates. All right, and then who uses oil? Well, everybody, right? Everybody uses oil for something or other. Uh, one of the interesting things that's actually happened over the last 10 years is that the United States and the European Union uh, have started using less oil than they did in the past. Having said that, though, overall oil usage for the world is up considerably. Right. So why is that? Why is world consumption rising if the U.S. and the EU are using less oil than in the past? Rising populations, rising affluence, increased production, lower infant mortality, or higher levels of education. So it's really tempting to say um, that rising populations would be the reason for this, okay? Um, but it's really going to be about rising affluence. I mean, you can have an increasing population without having a proportional increase in the demand for oil. But in rising affluence, you're consuming more products, right? Um, so you're going to be using all of those derivatives, more of those, uh, and think plastic is only one of them, okay? But also more people are going to be able to afford cars, right? There's going to be more construction, and so you're going to be using a lot of those, um, the gasoline and the diesel and the fuel oils and things like that. So it's affluence that is going to be the key to using more oil than before. Now having said that, sometimes higher levels of education about conservation of oil products um, will help lower some of that usage and then also just producing more energy efficient things uh, is going to have a serious impact on the amount of anything that you're using, right, if, if things are, are more efficient, right? Uh, so the answer to this though is rising affluence, okay? And when we look at consumption, uh, the United States is currently the biggest consumer, right? Having said that though, uh, China and Asia, right, and this is mostly going to be India, um, they are rising every single year, and Europe actually is not that far behind us in reality, okay? And then when we look at oil consumption, Oil consumption, again, in the United States, the EU, and Japan has actually uh, gone down. That's going down slowly, but it's gone down. It's the rest of the world where, where rising affluence is the key. That's where it's all going up. And an interesting side note is that consumption actually uh, tops global production and we have reserves that are stored and so that's kind of where where we make up the gap there but consumption is actually greater than uh, global production okay so who's got it right Saudi Arabia has the most oil followed by Russia and the United States is actually third uh, followed by a lot of countries fall into the next category China Iran uh, Canada and Mexico all have about well in the UAE all have about the same Brazil is in there too um, but the three big oil producers are Saudi Arabia Russia and the United States and when you start looking at the distribution of proved reserves and proved res reserves are reserves that um, we know are there and that are producing, you can see that the Middle East historically and still does have the bulk of the oil. Having said that though, that 
is going down compared to others because of new technologies that have allowed us to open up new channels for oil production, specifically in Central and South America. Okay, so again, when we start looking at uh, production, what's going up, Saudi Arabia is going to go up, the U.S. is going to go up a whole lot. It's actually, uh, by 2011, it had been down, but over the last just couple of years, it's skyrocketing and it will continue to go up. Uh, Russia, stay about the same, it'll go up. Iraq is going to start producing a lot more. Canada, they have some reserves that we can now access, the same with Brazil that we couldn't before. Okay, um, and so there are several countries that are going to have these huge changes in what they can produce, and that's because some of our unconventional oil sources and uh, light tight oil, which can be fracked, right? And so um, the other thing that we're going to talk about too, in terms of our unconventional fuels, that is going to be shale oil and shale gas. And we'll talk about this a little bit more in class because you will actually be uh, extracting oil from oil sands. And so we're going to see what that process looks like. But the reason that those numbers are changing so much is you can see that all of these places that are tan or brown have shale oil that has, or shale gas that has not or is just now being accessed. Okay, so what's the downside? Well, spills. The big, big, big problem, aside from just the things that go with drilling, and drilling has a lot of the same problems that mining does. And so when we've talked about the environmental issues associated with mining, the only difference, the only real big difference, uh, is that you don't actually have a huge open area. You don't have to, like you do in, in surface mining, you don't have to open up everything and destroy all of the, the habitat and then have to replace it. With oil, it's a little bit more like underground mining, where you're actually going in underneath and you're making changes to the interior, right, of, of the crust there. So otherwise, though, all the roads, um, all of the sp the um, leakage, right? So in, in mines, you've got the acid mine drainage. Well, in oil, you've got all of the uh, drilling fluids that leak, the groundwater contamination in the same way, stuff like that, okay? So there's a lot of parallels to the actual e extraction and recovery processes. One thing that mines don't have, though, that oil definitely has that's unique to oil is spills, right? Is spills. And so there are a lot of issues with that and and the most sensitive areas in terms of oil spills are going to be areas where there's water and so when we start talking about huge oil spills they're all going to be water um, located in, in aquatic areas and so you can see this is an oil rig these things are huge they're out in the middle of wherever they happen to be there's a lot in the North Sea, in Norway, there's a lot in the Gulf of Mexico, um, and we'll t we'll talk about some of those. We'll mostly focus on on ours uh, in the Gulf of Mexico. Okay, and when spills happen, it really does not go very well because you have several things happening. One, you've got first of all fires; they they can actually catch fire, and then the ocean itself burns. Right? That's that's never good. Um, and then you have the lighter um, fractions of the oil are going to float on the surface and this is really bad for all the column of life right because remember in open water the majority of life is going to be a, is going to be in that um, the photo zone right and so where you have light is is reaching and that's going to be blocked by a lot of that oil not to mention the fact that it's toxic um, you also will have the heavier distillates the heavier fraction well it's, you're not distilling them so the heavier fractions will um, sink to the bottom and they'll coat the benthic community at the bottom so that that's a really bad thing that's associated with oil spills so which of the following in terms of oil spills uh, is the least damaging oil spill? The Gulf of Mexico oil spill, the Ixtoc 1 oil well explosion, the Exxon Valdez, or the Arabian Gulf spill? Well, interestingly enough, the answer to this is actually the Exxon Valdez, right? The Exxon Valdez is the least uh, damaging or the, the smallest in size with all of those, the other three that you were looking at, um, the Gulf of Mexico oil spill, that is, that is 
um, the biggest accidental spill that's ever occurred, the Ixtoc 1 oil well explosion off the coast of Mexico, um, that is the second largest accidental spill. And then the Arabian Gulf spill, that was intentional. Um, that was done in the Kuwait War. Saddam Hussein actually ordered the ships to be destroyed in the harbor and then also the heads knocked off of oil wells and so oil sprayed out um, just into everywhere. I mean there was so much oil and everything was burning that it was like midnight in the middle of the day. So that is actually the largest oil catastrophe that we've ever had and it was entirely intentional. But then um, number one and two, Gulf of Mexico and Ixtoc Ix one, those are the largest accidental spills. The Exxon Valdez is like 36th on the list but it was catastrophic for the Alaskan coast and it it was really big at the time that it happened and it was entirely preventable because the captain piloting the ship was actually drinking and so it is a drunk driving accident uh, for all practical purposes. Now on your PowerPoint I have a little oil drop here you can click and get some more information um, but one of the the biggest things that stuck in the public's mind and was the big emotional factor was the damage to wildlife and this is the thing about coastal oil spills when you have the oil spill so much closer to the coast, you typically have a, a lot of wildlife damage, right? There's a lot of, of death for organisms, I mean, large complex organisms like your birds and your mammals and fish. Um, and then you're also going to have the actual shore and the benthic community coated in oil, which is bad. And then just a little side note on the Deepwater Horizon, which was the platform, the BP platform that exploded, and it is officially the largest accidental spill in the world, right? And it lasted uh, for a long time, and it was very sad. Um, Eleven people died in the explosion. There's actually a movie out uh, in 2016. There's a movie out about it, um, but it spilled ridiculous amounts of oil and BP tried really hard to plug the well actually down on the surface where the oil was pouring out after the pipings you know ripped apart um, but one of the interesting things was that this could have been a whole lot more catastrophic than it was and it was bad I mean don't get me wrong it was really bad but it was a great opportunity to employ all sorts of new technologies that had been developed to prevent um, oil from spreading and once it did spread to help clean it up. Now again there was a lot of damage to this so this is not like a sunshine and roses story. There was a lot of damage but it could have been a whole lot worse and we found out that a lot of the the things that that we could do to um, clean up w were actually working and that was very cool. Um, so there's we'll talk and we'll talk about that later on when we talk about remediation more. Okay, and then if you look at all of the places that are threatened by petroleum exploration, it's a lot, right? And so there's a lot of environmental damage that goes with oil. But one of the questions that you have to ask yourself is, that's great if we want to stop using petroleum, but what do we do instead? How do we make that transition? What are our options to switch to? And is it economically and socially viable, right? Um, can people do it? Will people do it? and can we maintain a robust economy if we do that, right? And and that's what you have to figure out, is what you think is the best way to go, okay? So shifting off of oil, let's talk a little bit about natural gas, which actually has some very interesting new technologies that have been developed um, that may allow it to replace some of the coal and the oil that we're using. Now, having said that though, it's also more expensive than coal and oil and it has some issues that go with our est extraction processes. But first of all, what's actually in uh, natural gas? Um, predominantly methane. Most of it is methane. There's some ethane in there and there's propane. Um, propane is going to be what you're doing in your gas fire grills and stuff like that. And then methane is what is your, most of you have gas heaters, some of you have gas stoves, that's going to be the methane. Now, like all the rest of the fossil fuels, there's nitrogen and there's some sulfur in there. There's less of that in natural gas. It's actually the cleanest burning of the three fossil fuels. Um, if you're just burning it straight out, coal is the dirtiest. Having said that though, remember that there are ways to clean the effluent for all three of those things to make them cleaner than they are now. 
now. And again, I want to remind you that regardless of the fossil fuel that you're talking about, there's still the CO2 issue. No matter how much you clean up the other pollutants in it, there's still CO2. And bottom line is we will run out. Even though we've extended the lifespan of these fuels by finding new reserves and new technologies, that's great, but we're still going to run out at some point. And so we have to start thinking of the future. Okay, so who's got natural gas? Uh, pretty much the same places that have oil because remember that natural gas and oil hang out together. So we've got our conventional fields. Um, these are the ones that are typically above oil. Like uh, shale oils, we've got shale gases. Then we've got tight gases. These are kind of um, the same thing as uh, oil sands a little bit, except there you've got a viscosity issue, but in your mind you can kind of imagine them as having the same issues in terms of getting everything out. Um, we've got coal bed gas. Sometimes you'll have methane that's trapped with coal, and we can get that out of there. Um, and then you've got some other gas called sour gas. We're not going to actually talk about that, but that's just uh, natural gas with lots and lots of sulfur. Okay, and where are those things? Again, in the same places we have oil, but you'll see that there's actually a lot of natural gas out there. Okay, same thing with oil. You drill a well to it. Uh, it's in secondary, uh, sorry, primary recovery. Then it's going to come out on its own. If it, you're in that secondary recovery phase, then you're going to have to pump it out. And we will talk about fracking in just a second. But bottom line is you have the producing wells and then you're still going to have to inject something in to get in that second uh, recovery to get all of that out. And then I just put this picture in here because I wanted to show you um, we have all these shale basins and we have all these oil wells and all these things but the reason that I, I picked this picture is because it also has all of the pipelines the oil and gas pipelines and I think that it's very interesting to see that network and I want you to see that because I want you to think about um, how ubiquitous these products are. I mean, they're everywhere. We're using them in lots of things. And so in order to make changes, you're going to have to think about the infrastructure that supports uh, these fossil fuels. You're going to have to think about the products that are produced from these fossil fuels. Uh, and that's going to be really important. So next mini quiz question. Which of the following is not an advantage of natural gas? It's currently cheaper compared to other fossil fuels and cheaper than electricity when used for supplying home appliances. Natural gas appliances are also cheaper compared to electric ones. It burns without releasing any soot or sulfur dioxide, emits 45% less carbon dioxide than coal, and 30% less than oil. It uses a, it, sorry, it's a multi-use fuel, cooking, heating, generating electricity, powering vehicles, a substitute for diesel and gasoline, producing plastics, paints, fertilizers, etc. Uh, methane is a more powerful greenhouse gas, 21 times that of CO2. Okay, so it turns out that it is a more powerful greenhouse gas, and that is not an advantage. It is a multi-use fuel, and that is awesome. You can do all sorts of things with these, and uh, we're starting to figure out ways to liquefy uh, natural gas so we can use it as a substitute for diesel and gasoline. Um, it does actually emit less carbon dioxide, although it still emits carbon dioxide. It doesn't re release sulfur dioxide, um, and there's no particulates because it's already a gas. That's pretty exciting, and it is cheaper compared to other fossil fuels and cheaper than electricity when supplying home appliances. So what we're talking about here is heating and cooking, but when you generate electricity with natural gas, that electricity is actually more expensive than coal generated electricity. Okay, so just keep that in mind. There, there's a little catch there. Okay, but the answer to this is that uh, it is greenhouse gas and that is not an advantage. All right. So what do we use natural gas for? Well, like I already said, we use it for um, in, a lot in industrial processes. Um, there's the residential and commercial uses for heating and cooking. We do actually generate a lot of electricity with it, even though it's more expensive than coal there. And then there are natural gas vehicles. For instance, UPS uses natural gas vehicles. Um, there are some bus fleets that are natural gas as well. And then here, I just want you to make sure that you look at this. And this is as of 2015. Uh, uh, our usage of each of the fuels that we've been talking about. And petroleum still takes the lion's share, but natural gas is right behind it, followed by uh, coal is the third. Okay, let's talk about fracking. What's fracking? Fracking is basically where you go in and you create fissures in the rock 
that the gas can escape into. Um, you can uh, pump a liquid in, but you're cracking, you're fracturing these um, rock layers, okay? So that's kind of it, and there's a little bit more to it, but that's basically what I want you to know about it, okay? So you're creating these fractures or fissures in the rock layer. Um, the way that you do it is you pump a really highly pressurized fluid, so it's going to exceed the stress point of the rock. You're going to get these cracks. Environmental issues, all of that stuff can get into the water, so there's contamination of groundwater by um, all of the pumping and drilling fluids. It uses a huge amount of water because you have this pressurized fluid that you're actually pumping in there. Um, and it's possible that there is a connection to an increase in seismic activity, which I'm going to talk about in just a second. But first, which of the following is not a disadvantage of natural gas? Natural gas leaks can lead to explosions and it's toxic. It can be isolated during the extraction process and therefore requires minimal processing. Uh, leakage is difficult to detect and expensive to fix. There's not enough natural gas to replace other fossil fuels and supply and demand. And then natural gas vehicles have lower mileage than conventional cars. Okay, natural gas does leak. Um, you can smell natural gas in your house because they've added hydrogen sulfide to it. Otherwise, it is colorless, it is odorless, it is toxic, and it can blow up, right? So there's always a certain amount of, of safety precautions that have to be taken. It can be isolated during the extraction process, and it does require minimal processing. So the answer to this is two. It's actually um, easier to deal with. You don't have to refine it in the same way. You don't have to process it in the same way that you would oil or, or coal. Um, it is difficult to detect leaks. I mean, it's a odorless, colorless gas. And when you do have leaks, they're expensive to fix. All right. And whether you're talking about commercial, industrial, uh, or you're talking about residential, it's all expensive. There's not enough natural gas to actually replace coal. You can't replace coal and petroleum with natural gas. Um, and as you do that, and you start to have higher demand for natural gas, the price are going to go up, so that's a disadvantage. And natural gas vehicles don't have as high mileages as conventional cars, so that's a disadvantage. So number two is an advantage. Just to kind of sum up the environmental concerns about uh, fracking, right, is when we get back to that idea of having the waste, the drilling fluids and things like that, um, into the water, that's going to be a drinking water issue, it's going to be an ecosystem issue, so surface water issue in addition to just being a groundwater issue. Okay, um, You're also going to have this methane right, that you're pumping out, some of that is going to dissolve into the water and into the groundwater, and so when you pump that out for say residential, well it doesn't have to be, just municipal use, uh, you can end up with flammable tap water and that has happened. If you remind me in class, I'll show you a video of that. Um, you also can have well blowouts. You can have pollution that goes with all of that. And then in some cases, there are fluid spills when you're talking about some of the drill, drilling fluids and waste fluids. Um, as far as the actual drilling process, it's got the same environmental issues that oil production does. Um, so whether you're talking about fracking or whether you're talking about just straight up conventional drilling, that's all going to have this, the same kinds of issues. It's just that fracking has some of these additional issues. The last thing that we talk about are the earthquakes, and that's the seismicity factor. Um, there is a lot of talk about how fracking causes earthquakes, and we've had ourselves a lot of earthquakes over the last few years. and. In our case, it's actually probably not fracking that is, is causing those earthquakes. There are really two things that will trigger the earthquakes that, that we do. And one is fracking. If you frack directly into a fault line, you are putting a lot of pressure on a place that already is volatile. Okay, And so that's going to cause earthquakes. Some of the Oklahoma earthquakes, uh, there was an Ohio earthquake that were actually related directly to fracking. It's hard to know where all the fault lines are. It's not like, you know, the San Andreas. You can see it. You know it's there. There are spider webs of faults all over the place. Uh, and so you, sometimes you just don't know it's there, and so you frack directly into it. Now, fracking away from the fault line, you know, there may be a connection, there may not be, but one of the things that does seem to trigger uh, small earthquakes is deep well injection. And we're going to talk about deep well injection more later on, but our earthquakes 
probably were more likely due to deep well injection um, than they were actually to, to fracking processes themselves. And again, we'll talk about deep well injection, but essentially as you're pulling all of this stuff out of the ground, the oil and natural gas, you can replace it. You can store things uh, like hazardous chemicals or waste fluids or whatever in those reserves, um, but they can lubricate, if you will, the plates to cause them to slip. And so that's where you get some of the earthquake action going on. But again, ours was probably related more to um, deep well injection and fracking. Okay. Um, this is just to give you a list of the stuff that's actually in uh, fracking fluid. A lot of the stuff is also going to be in just regular drilling fluid as well. So that's just a, a list for that. Okay, and so when we look at general environmental issues associated with oil and gas, I have put in here this nice little um, sort of concept flowchart thing. Okay, and then the last slide I want to show you is because we've been talking about mining, we've been talking about coal, we've been talking about oil and natural gas. This is just a fun map that kind of gives you a distribution of minerals all over the world. Okay, and that is it. I know that this was a longer video notes than I normally give you at, at 30 minutes, um, but thanks for listening. If you have any questions, please put them on the video notes board or be sure to ask them in class and I will see you next time.